Hey, this is Road Warrior Animal. And when you're in Chicago, listen to Harv Roman on WCGO. Listen up. Yeah, AM 1590 WCGO Radio in Chicago, where Chicago goes for celebrity hotline conversations early on a Saturday morning. And on this particular Saturday morning, um, I, I'm going to be a kid for a minute. Uh, I'm 50 years old now, but I grew up watching wrestling. I watched AWA wrestling back in the day. I watched Bob Loose wrestling, you know, before that. And eventually, a, a group, a tag team that came out of Chicago came to be by the name of the Road Warriors. And on the celebrity hotline is Joe Laurinaitis, animal of the Road Warriors. How are you? Good, good, good. How you doing? I'm I'm doing okay. It, it kind of it feels weird to say it out loud that I'm 50 years old and I'm calling you excited to do a celebrity hotline conversation based on the fact that I have been following wrestling since I was a kid. Do you get that a lot? Uh, I get that all the time. And, and, and is it something where you you think your appeal would be mostly to young people, or is it to the point where it's basically people you know our age that are buying into what the Warriors had done back then? Well, you know, I mean, I think Hawk and Isaac Himmick has transcends through many generations. I mean, uh, it's just as popular today as it probably was 20 years ago. I mean, you know, our tag team uh, likeness is the only thing that's on 2013 and 2014 WWE games. you got to beat everybody else to get to us, and then that's just crazy, man. This many years after Hawk's passing, uh, you know, we've been away from the WWE, and it's just like, uh, you know, it felt like last week we were still there. Who would have thought that, that you know, at the top of the pyramid still, um, when I was watching AWA wrestling and Bob Loose wrestling back in the day, you know, the, the tag teams back then were like the High Flyers and Jesse Ventura with Adrian Adonis. You guys came a few years after that. The one thing that, that stood out to me when it came to the Road Warriors, when I was young and watching the Road Warriors, I actually wasn't watching them. I was reading about you guys because back then, all of the TV shows were, were kind of regional, and so what would happen is, here in Chicago, we're watching AWA, we're watching Bob Luce, and then we would have to read about the NWA and the Road Warriors, and I remember buying all those magazines and, and wondering, man, if only they would come to Chicago. Yeah, The Wrestler and Pro Wrestling Illustrated, all those magazines, I know. And then eventually you guys were able to do that. Oh, before we go, you know, you are so cool to, to do this. Um, you're using social media now and you know we befriended each other on Facebook and I, I follow what you do and one of the reasons that I wanted to get you on the celebrity hotline was to talk a little bit about your interaction when you're on the Facebook you're on the Facebook with all of your fans a bunch of your friends your family and you're interacting with everybody so you know it seems like you've been fan friendly you know from the beginning and it continues to this day well you know Hawk and I you know we learned from real early on in our career that without the wrestling fan, you don't have wrestling. So, I mean, you got to be respectful. you got to be nice. Um, although, with, you know, every 100,000 great wrestling fans, you know, I get one bonehead that I end up having to block on my Facebook because, you know, it just gets a little ridiculous. But, you know, for the most part, the fans are great. Um, like I said, without them, well, we wouldn't even have a job. So, Oh, it's all good, man, yeah. It's kind of interesting because I used to watching wrestling. They used to do the shows out at the International Amphitheater with the AWA. And at the time, everything was thought to be legitimate. Everything was thought to be 100%. And there were times at that amphitheater where the fans would go so crazy because of what was happening. I remember back then, I, I think it was Jerry Blackwell and The Sheik, and they had turned against the country, and, and it seemed as if the International Amphitheater was going to have a fight within itself because of what was happening in the ring. Um, things are a little bit different now, but when you started, you know, the, the wrestling business was considered, you know, legitimate. We weren't, talk, we weren't thinking about, you know, what, what was happening that really wasn't happening. Everything was looked at as real. Well, I think, you know, all along, people wanted to believe that it was entertainment or fake or whatever, but, you know, they would <clears throat> they would still fight it. They would still say, no, 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 it's real. Did you see the road warriors close that guy, close line that guy, or hit him with the chair? You know, what's funny is I'm reading the road warriors, Danger, Death, and the Rush of Wrestling, which is the reason why I wanted to call and, and, and talk to you. And as you read the book, there was a point in, in your own career that you said, wait a minute, this is real. You guys were getting hit for real. Oh, yeah. I mean, and then, you know, 
if anybody would have asked us early in their career, hey, is wrestling fake or is wrestling real? And we, they would have said it was fake, you know, we'd fight them for it. I mean, that was just the way you protected your craft, you know, and your business and your job. You know, if, if anybody does any searching on the YouTube, I think the most famous um, legitimacy video would be the, the John Stossel interview where David Schultz, who also used to be in the AWA, decided that, you know, he was going to knock him around because he was, you know, saying that wrestling wasn't necessarily real. I guess back then, you know, the, the business had to be protected, huh? Sorry there. I'm sorry? No, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, you talking about uh, Dr. Dr. Depp. Right. David Schultz. Yeah, he um he took he took it a little bit too far, and I remember interviews where he said this is what he was told to do. Hey, l let's talk about Chicago. Um, up until I read the book, I I didn't realize that you know Chicago was a decision that was made, uh, not because you necessarily grew up here, but you you picked it as a hometown above and beyond the Minnesota when you got to the AWA. Can we talk about that? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just you know. Uh, you, you want to say you're from Minneapolis or Chicago, it's not really that hard of a choice. Um, you know, there's not too many monsters in the Midway coming from Minneapolis, St. Paul. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and you, know, you know, on top of that, you know, not only the Chicago Bulls or the Bears, you know, or our favorite teams, you know, and stuff like that growing up. And so it was, it was an easy, easy decision. You know, as we take this interview, you know, the Blackhawks are going up against the Minnesota Wild right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go Hawks. So, well, yeah, I was just going to ask you. I mean, you know, you've, you've got an adopted hometown, and then you've got your actual hometown, and the teams are going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Who would you, you know, end up picking in the series? Well, that's a hard one, man, you know, because guys like uh, Parisi that play for the Wild, uh, you know, he's around the same time my son James did. Uh, you know, and there's uh, Lucia's kid, uh, the Minnesota Gophers head coach, uh, Lucia's kid, Mario, plays for the Wild. So it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of hometown stuff there with my kids growing up and some of the players there. But, you know, I've always liked, you know, I was a big fan of uh, Chris Chelios, you know. There you so, go. I, I mean, uh, that, my, my heart goes with the Blackhawks. You know, one of the most refreshing things that I've seen, and, and it goes back to the DVD that was released by the WWE, where kids were talking about Hawk with some passing, and you go on the internet now, and your kids are talking about you and how cool it was. You know, you're, you've got a son who's in the NFL now, and he says, man, but if I could get in the ring, I would do that. So you've got a family that is tight, which it, it, it must have been tough to do as, as a professional wrestler. Oh, yeah, man. I had to have deals with the promoters, you know, because, you know, I was heavily into coaching with my kids, whether it was baseball, football, hockey. And, you know, I was very supportive of what my kids did. So, I, you know, I tried to make every game that I could, you know, and which sometimes meant, you know, not working as much as I could have. But, you know, hey, I would have rather been home. Well, that's an important case to make because if, if if the business takes away from the family and and you could see the way you guys interact with each other, then it, it may not be worth being in the business. And I would imagine that there are plenty of names that wound up, you know, suffering and not having good relationships because the business came first. So, you know, it's refreshing to know that family came first when it came to you. Oh, yeah, definitely family always, always came first. I mean, that's why I'm so close to my kids now. I mean, my oldest boy's 35 and... You know, you know, to this day, he and my, my son James and my daughter, we always say, hey, I love you before we hang up, and that's just the way it is. You know, this is the week of the NFL draft, and you've got a son who's in the NFL. One of the neatest pictures that I've seen online is the picture of you wearing the Ram colors and your son wearing the Warrior colors. Um, what is it like to have a son who's playing in the NFL now who's the professional athlete? It's like the roles have reversed. Oh, I know. I tell you what, man, I, I tell you one thing I do is I feel for the parents going through the NFL process right now. <clears throat> it is a yo-yo, up and down, emotional feeling. I mean, at the time, you know, my son James was a three-time first-team All-American at Ohio State, which hardly ever happens in NCAA football, you know. There's only been a few in its history. And, uh, you know, coming out of the draft, you think your kid's going in the top ten, that's where everybody tells you they're going, and then if they fall to, you know, beginning of the second round or something, you think it's a failure, and it's, and it's not. The bottom line is be, be happy that your kid's there and he's successful no matter what he does, you know. And that's what I learned over this time, and, uh, man, it's a trip having my son be in the NFL. You know, 
you think in high school, oh, yeah, he's going to go on to Ohio State, he's going to do decent maybe, you know, and you think, oh, maybe by his senior year he'll get on the field, and then, you know, James actually started against uh, Notre Dame in a Fiesta Bowl his freshman year. So, I mean, from then on, he never turned back, and then you hope, then he goes into pros, and uh, you think, oh, well, maybe he'll play in the pros, maybe he won't, and then when he's voted captain two years by his, by his peers and, everything else and man you know he's arrived you know what I mean and he's a pretty decent ball player too at that he's a good kid you know, it's kind of interesting when you're talking second generation because this past year the Rams played the Bears and then the Bears have a second generation athlete in Kyle Long and then of course you and your son with the second generation it, it's interesting because a lot of times parents may not necessarily want their kids to follow in their footsteps because they know how tough it's going to be well that's why I told James right away when I knew he had a chance to play football I said you play football <laughs> don't you dare worry about wrestling. I said, wrestling can come after football if you wanted to. <clears throat> you know, which a lot of guys did. I mean, you know, guys like Wahoo McDaniels and a lot of guys did that, you know, back in the day. <clears throat> it would be no different for James. I mean, he's already got the name. He's doing well. Uh, he's in the middle of his second contract right now. And by the time a second contract gets done, he won't even be 30 years old. I mean, he'll still have enough time to do a third contract, so... You know, play it as long as you can, man. Don't give up the sport you love to do something else because you never can go back. There's no do-overs. No, but in terms of the circle that, that that he was in, was there a little pressure for him to become a pro wrestler? Or they just said, you know, Dad does what Dad does, but you do what you're doing. Well, you know, you have my brother John, who was the GM of Raw for a while. My brother Mark worked for WCW. He was a... Uh, Rage and Fury, the Wrecking Crew, they were they were tag team champs in WCW years back, and then you had Hawk and I. Uh, yeah, of course, you know, he, you know, from ten years old on up, he was you know pile driving or power slamming or tombstone and doing Undertaker's move to his little sister on trampoline in the backyard. So I mean, he's a natural. Even when you know he graduated college, when Vince saw him, Vince McMahon, he told James, "You always got a home here in the WWE, James." And you know, and then saw him a year later after a couple of had to play in pro ball, and I said, "Hey, if pro ball doesn't work out." I mean, so you know, they were he planted the seed that they would like him, but uh, James is firm on the stance that uh, even though he loves wrestling, I don't think he's as into it as much anymore as he was. But you know, he he stuck with the right choice. Hey, talking about your career here in Chicago, Chicago became somewhat of an adopted hometown and, and as I was you know thinking about the things that I wanted to talk to you about I says you know what he was in the side town rumble he was at Comiskey Park when they fought the Freebirds um, they did Starcade at UIC that was a uh, matches that I actually was at when they used to do the UIC so being from Chicago as an adopted town you did a lot of big events here oh yeah man <laughs> Chicago's got some of the best wrestling fans or sports fans for that matter in, in the country <laughs> I mean, when you wrestle the UIC Pavilion, it's such a close-knit building. It holds about 18,000 people. Mm -hmm. Then you go to the Rosemont Horizon. You know, all these buildings were phenomenal sites, even in Comiskey Park. I mean, we made this year at Comiskey Park. We had, we had more people come in to watch us at Comiskey Park than they had the game. You know, the interesting thing is, if you, if you could find that match online, the fans at Comiskey Park were not sitting in the stadium seats. They were sitting on the ball field and the ring was in the middle of the ball field and as you guys were you know fighting in the field there were like fans within feet of you guys oh yeah I mean, there was no ropes at that time you know that was you know pre-barrier pre-rope days you know yeah it was crazy and on top of that we're fighting the freebirds you know how, how much fun is it as opposed to taxing when you guys are fighting teams such as the Freebirds or the Koloffs back in the day? Because I, I would imagine it's fun because you're putting on a show, but I imagine it, it by the time it's all over and done with, um, you're hurting. Well, you know, back then we worked uh, 280 to 300 days a year, too. So, I mean, it was a little harder. Guys today work about 200 days tops. You know, so that extra 80 days to 100 days on your body just is wear and tear. Besides that, you know, working out. I mean, I've had nine surgeries, you know, so, I mean, it, 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 it could take a toll on you. Well, you, you've been active up until recently. What do you see as some of the differences between when you were at the, the height of your career as a champion compared to what we see now? Well, I think one of the, one of the, the differences behind the scenes is when I was younger, guys that have paved the way for me were the guys running the company. Today, uh, instead of having guys like myself or 
smash demolition or rapid demolition that or Bret Hart or guys like that coming in and running the company. They have people writing storylines that were soap operators. It's way really different. You know, I, I've read about that. I'm not, not in your case, but a lot of other cases where the, the professional wrestlers, there was a backlash because it did become, you know, people that were writers that were writing stories. And initially, when it came to pro wrestlers, you guys were doing your own, you know, I don't want to use the word gimmick. I don't like the word gimmick, but you were writing your own storylines. You were creating stuff and you were discussing things behind the scenes rather than having a script handed to you. Yeah, well, we, I mean, that's what made it separate us from the guys that today. I mean, even for the Hall of Fame, I think they gave me a writer for the Hall of Fame when I got inducted, and I told the guy, yeah, well, thank you, but, but I'll just do my own speech. You know, I, I saw that recently, and it was about a five-minute speech, and um, this year there were speeches that win 20, 25 minutes. Um, so you, you were not reading cue cards. You were doing something that was from the heart. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I know it only seemed like five minutes on the version that you get to watch, but if you watch the full version of that, uh, oh, and I had a long film. Oh, that's because I leave it on the even on the DVD that I've got. I don't believe I've got the the full version. And you know, you you do want to hear some of the backstories. You do want to hear about some of the people that paved the way. Um, I had to read about the Minnesota family that you came from. You know, not only your personal family but the wrestling family. And we didn't quite hear that in the speech. Uh, Minnesota. There were so many names that you came up with that all ended up in the same business as you. Oh, yeah, I mean, there was quite a bit. You know, you had from Ravishing Rick Rude to uh, Nikita Koloff to Scott Norton to, you know, Hawk, myself, uh, Vladimir Pietrov, which was, you know, Al Blake, and then you had uh, Nord the Barbarian, the Berserker guy. He was he was from there. Brad Rangan, Beverly Brothers are both from Minnesota. I mean, there was quite a few guys that come out of Minnesota, you know. It was interesting because Brad Rangans, believe it or not, was one of the guys that I really liked back in the AWA days because he was a wrestler. He actually wrestled. And Nick Bakunka was the same. These were guys that wrestled. And at some point, you know, it was the same league that had Bruiser and Crusher. You guys ended up having the torch passed, or maybe you just grabbed the torch and ran with it when you fought against the Crusher and the Bruiser. When that all came down, um, you guys are fairly new to the business. Was there any backlash with you guys going up against Bruiser and Crusher and, and basically walking over them? No, no, not with Crusher and Bruiser themselves. I mean, they actually didn't go off of their feet for 30 years in the wrestling business, you know. And uh, there was backlash from, uh, not bad backlash, but making fun of stuff like guys like Bobby Heenan. I remember when we press slammed Crusher and Bruiser in Milwaukee <clears throat> and in Chicago, you know, he didn't come to the locker room afterwards and starts looking at Crush on Bruiser and you know they say, What are you looking at? And Bobby goes, I'm looking for the, looking at the nosebleeds. You guys have never been that high off your feet, you know, and that kind of stuff Crush on Bruiser had to had to take. I said, but you know, how can I knew it was a change of the guard. I mean, you know, it's hey, God bless Crush on Bruiser, man. They both were phenomenal for our business and they did a great job, but at that time it was some time for somebody new to come in, you know, which I'm still waiting for the next tag team to come in. That's got to be a huge tag team. Well, you know, the interesting thing these days when they do tag teams, it's it's like they let's get some fan favorites, put them together, and there there's not a lot of story to it. It's something that that went down at eight o'clock in the evening, and by ten o'clock, <laughs> they settled the feud. When you were AWA and NWA, you know the, these feuds. I mean, you talk about a free a free bird feud. These things went on for months. Oh, yeah, they, they, if you do it right, they can go on for years. I mean, you know, but that, that's what I'm saying. And when you do your job right, the people will let you know. I did the WWE Raw 1000 special last year. I had not wrestled since 2006, and even back then when they used me, with me at Heidenreich, it was horrible. But when I walked out in Baltimore, <clears throat> they played my music, and I did that Raw 1000 special, the people went crazy like I was just in the ring the day before you know it's interesting that you say because in one of my notes I wanted to mention what they called the pop there was really nothing called the pop until you guys came along it became a road warrior pop based on the sound of um, Ozzy Osbourne and Black Sabbath and now in any sport when they play music for you know whoever the team is or whoever the individual is then you get your pops that all started with you guys yeah, yeah, and they still call it that today, and, and I guess in the locker room and everything else, you know, hey, you got a Road Warrior pop, you know, and, and it's kind of funny because, you know, 
we're 10 years removed almost <laughs> from that time, of, you know, that we were in the ring. It was kind of, it, hey, it's a tribute, man. And, and, and as long as it goes on, good for us, I guess. Yeah, I want to talk about a couple of things before we go because I know we're short on time. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we lost one of your brothers in paint um, who you guys had worked with before. And, um, you know, it was, it was a shocker to a lot of us because he had just made an appearance at this year's Hall of Fame, and, and then the next day he's gone. Um, you, how did you hear about and how did you react to the passing of um, the Ultimate Warrior? Well, I mean, I heard it like everybody else did. I mean, I heard it through the channels. I probably heard it a little sooner <clears throat> than the regular media. But, um, you know, when I watched Raw that night after the Hall of Fame, um, I'm just saying from my own opinion, uh, Warrior did not look healthy to me. He was breathing very heavy, and when you watch the interview back, he's having to take deep breaths, and when he's trying to growl, he's got no air in his lungs. Like getting these younger to do that, you know what I mean? So I can tell there was something wrong only because <clears throat> about four years ago, I went through my own issues with my heart years ago. I mean, I took care of it now, but I'm saying four years ago, man, I was, I know what that look is. I know what that feeling is. And, you know, Jim was limping down to the ring and he was all winded. And it's not that long rock from the curtain to the ring. I mean, it shouldn't have been that. But it, it's a good lesson to kids. To all the guys that have died in our wrestling business under 55, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Most of them did from A to Z that they shouldn't have done. Okay? You cannot put your body through that yo yo effect of up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And I hate to say it, but Warrior was no different. Well, the, um, in the interesting thing with you is. You know, and reading the book, and, and even back then, because you guys, you guys were like power lifters. You were you were already powerhouses when you became professional wrestlers. So it seems as if everything that you did, you know, came naturally. You were just a big, strong guy, you know, who was throwing people through through <laughs> through Prince's <laughs> Prince's nightclub back in the day. Yet so many others decided we have to get big in a different way. And like you say, they they just did not survive. Yeah, and not, not only type that, then there's the multiple party drugs that they're into it. And I was never a drug guy, so I can speak freely of it. I mean, but, you know, guys, whether it's upper or downer or muscle relaxer or whatever, pain medicine, I mean, you just cannot put your body through that kind of stress. And some guys did it for years. I mean, I have some of my greatest friends, you know, from the British Bulldog to Mr. Perfect to... Ravishing was rude. Yeah. I mean, guys that were very close, you know, that are gone because of this, you know, and, and uh, you know, even Flying Brian and stuff, you know, I mean, you know, Pillman. There's, there's a lot of guys, man, that should be around for a long, long time, and their families are suffering from that, man. I just think well, it, it's horrible, and it's interesting, too, because you have a background. You have, you have a... Um an athletic training background were there times that you wanted to talk to some of these guys and say yo um you might not want to you know make that type of decision or did you just go about your own business well you know i made the choice early on man because i had a family even if i didn't have a family i would have made the same choice it's about all me about being on the road doing my job and getting back in the gym the next day <clears throat> a lot of these guys would do what they weren't supposed to and they wouldn't make it to the gym the next day because so they weren't ever replenishing their, their bodies or their system um you know, of course, I wanted to talk to guys, but hey, I've learned early on, man, when the guys are in that state of mind, they're not that easy to talk to. Well, and, and then finally, um, let's talk a little bit about um, somebody who used to work with Diamond Dallas Page and the work that he has done with some of the former professional wrestlers who had, you know, they, they had some tough times, and Diamond Dallas, in essence, has adopted them, and if you see Jake the Snake now compared to what he used to be, um, it's an amazing thing that DDP is doing. Do you follow that? Uh, I do a little bit. Uh, man, it's funny you say that. My brother Mark uh, just sent me DDP's yoga stuff. He's been doing it for about three months. Uh, he loves it. You know, um, hey, whatever's working for Jake, more power to Paige. I mean, because Jake was a lost soul for about 30 years. And if Paige is reaching reach like that, then good. Then I hope it works. You know, and whoever the guys are, I hope it's worth it. Um, More power to page, you know. 
So l let's say there are young people now and they're watching, you know, the WWE and, and they're interested in becoming professional wrestlers. They, they, they really want to do what they see on TV, um, you know, minus, well, they don't do chair shots anymore, but boy, I've seen some of those backyard wrestling tapes. That is insane what people will do. But if there are young people that, that want to get in the business, is that something that you advise them to do or do you ask them to, to, to maybe look in a different direction? Well, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm not going to you know, squash anybody's dreams. If it's your dream, do it and pursue it. But you're going to pursue it 150%. Don't pursue it with the expectation that you're self-deserving or you have a self-righteous, you know, fight to be a superstar. A superstar is something that has to be earned and it's somebody that has to want to work for. It. A lot easier to climb that ladder than it is to stay on top. Fortunately, Hawk and I got on that ladder in about the first six months of the business, and we stayed on top of that ladder for 20 years, which is hard to do. And uh, you got to be willing to make sacrifices, and you know, not only in your personal life but in your business life, man. You just got to do what you got to do. Well, people don't think about that. It, you know, it, it's it's a tough business, number one. But when you're breaking in, you know, it's not as if you got private planes and, and limousines taking you guys everywhere. You know, I read stories about you know six to a car, and you guys are like 300 pounds each. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of our stuff, a lot of our stuff in the day was flying to the Columbus, Ohio, then driving around from Ohio to Virginia to West Virginia, back through Ohio again, and then down to Michigan. Back down to Ohio, uh, through Cincinnati, then fly out of Columbus. We would do that for a week. Then we travel all around Georgia for a week and do that. My, my longest stretch in a row was 90 days in a row. Wow. So you got to be willing to do 90 days straight, you know, sometimes, or even like today it's different. I think you do, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, have off Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it's a little different schedule now. But you got to be willing to sacrifice. The whole the big thing is the people out there listening, especially young ones that want to try to get in it. And don't expect to be a stud right away. You're not going to be a stud. I mean, it takes years to learn this business. It takes years to learn what the guy across the ring does and how to do it right with the people want to believe that you're doing things to people and they're doing it to you. I mean, it's just not going to happen overnight. And, and a lot of that is, is covered in your book. Um, you, you made a decision a couple of years ago to, to write a book. Um, you know, it was a while after you had retired, so how did that decision come about? Well, I had a guy that, a writer that was bugging me for years and years and years and years, and I finally said, oh, okay, I'll do it. And then that's when we did it. And I, you know, hey, I made New York Times bestseller for a while. Oh, no, I'm, so, I'm I mean, good. it was pretty good. So, but, you know, anyway, you know. You never know. I may talk to that book company. I mean, I mean, they just released my paperback version of the book now. So I may talk to them again about wanting to do maybe another book because I got a lot more stuff I could say. Really well, I'm, well, I'm glad you did. And your style of writing, um, you don't pull back punches. You you talk every you talk it all. You know, in, in all of us could relate to it. And you're you're brutally honest about what you had to do to break into the business and things that had to get done, whether or not, you know, powers that be, you know, wanted it done. So it's a good read and about halfway through it and, and I'll read it again. And if there's another book, you know, that that's, it's going to be refreshing because sometimes you wind up with books where they just talk about my favorite match and, and, and no, your, your book is, is life. Well, I try to tell the people, you know, the most frequently asked questions we get on the road, I tried to answer them. I mean, that's what I do. People want to know a little bit on the inside, and they, they want to know how it goes. And, you know, when, hey, when Hawk and I were wrestling, and we disappeared for three months, they want to say, well, why were you gone for three months? And, you know, well, quite honest, because my partner failed a drug test. I mean, you know, so you, you got to be honest, because they know already. They're just setting you up for the answer. Well, yeah, well, well there, there are no secrets these days. Back in the day... Um, you know, you, you would end up going to Japan and, and wrestling solo or with, uh, you know, a couple of fill-in guys, you know, for Hawk. And we didn't know. We're fans, so we're not thinking that there is a problem, but we did know that Road Warrior Animal was fighting solo. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. So so what next um, for Joe Laurinaitis? Um, you know, are, are you remaining active? Are you doing the fan festivals? Is there a chance that you'll be back in Chicago anytime soon? Well, you know, I, I stopped doing personal appearances for a couple of years because, <clears throat> to be quite honestly, you know, motors were trying to nickel and dime me to death, and I'm not going to go to some place for nothing. Uh, not that I'm better than anybody else, but I worked too hard to reach a certain status, and I just wasn't going to do it. 
Um, I just did my first one at uh, with the Sons of Anarchy and that big show out in New York uh, last week. It was great. Uh, I got another Comic Con in Myrtle Beach the 18th of this month. Um, so I'm, I'm getting back in the swing of things. I'm starting to do bigger events like Comic Cons and stuff like that. Uh, I just did a big show out in uh, New York. So. I mean, hey. You know, just getting back in the swing, you know what I mean? Anybody's interested in it, just contact me on my Facebook, I and mean, I'll answer you. But, uh, you know, that's what I've been doing. Well, that, that's pretty neat, too, because I did see a picture where, where the next generation and you were striking a pose. It was you and this little kid wearing the spikes, and it was so neat because to kids, you know, back then you were a superhero, and now, you know, you're, you're a legendary superhero, so that's pretty neat. Yeah, it, you know, it's amazing how, I mean... People are still selling my my action figure in Japan, and there's a Japanese company making my action figures over there still because they're still selling. I mean, and then Mattel just came out with my new figure from WWE that just came out like a month ago. So I mean, hey man, I'm still in the public eye, whether I want to be or not. So God bless it. Hey, it's, it's, I must have done something right. You know, talking about action figures, one of the one of the the. Um images I have in my head right now talking about action figures is when Precious Paul pulled out Hawk's action figure and stood it up at the podium at the Hall of Fame and an action figure got the Road Warrior pop. Yeah, yeah, you know, I had to take a couple deep breaths on that one. He, he Paul didn't tell me he was going to do that either. Wow. Well, I, I got such a kick out of talking to you. I'm glad that you picked up the phone and was able to have uh, this Celebrity Highline conversation. Um, you know, it's it's neat to be from the town that you adopted as a hometown, but but you didn't quite grow up here, did? Oh yeah, Claire, man, I was born in this, but hey, we've got when we're young, and when it's but when time gone, we just That is really cool. Appreciate it, and thanks. No problem. Hey, to all the Chicago listeners, at the end of the day, all you gotta remember is one thing: it's gonna be. Uh, Hey, this is Road Warrior Animal, and when you're in Chicago, listen to Harvey Roman on WCGO.